Thanks very much for being here uh, and inviting me. Um, when we talk about innovation and we talk about the things in life that we would like to change, a lot of people think about sending rockets to the moon, which is also was the previous speaker, talk about, talking about virtual assistants or having tools that you actually don't have to walk anymore. That's what for a lot of people is innovation when they think about it. We also can go almost to a conference every week where you can hear a futurist about what is our life going to look like in 2030 or in 2050. Fantastic long-term visions, this is going to happen to our lives and this is the technology that is going to bring us forward. But how is that going to help us today? What is really on the impact of that innovation today? Can we actually solve things right now? Don't, doesn't innovation leave us behind? Are we really up to speed? In all honesty, I think we are getting a bit carried away with all the innovations and the future-looking statements in 20 years, because today we have also issues to solve. We need innovations today, and we need practical people that make things happen now. We see in a lot of cases, especially in the research infrastructure that I represent, that a lot of people are not even aware of what we can offer, that we have solutions today that can be used, and people are not aware. Or we see that the innovations are there, but people are not acknowledged, or are not motivated to bring it to the market, so it stops, which is a shame. So therefore, innovation is key, but we also need to look at today. And then one thing you hear a lot today is actually, we are living in exponential times, and we are really living in fast times, and every, every day almost something changes. Well, let me give you an example that is actually not that bad. This painting was made in 1885 by Vincent van Gogh, and it's called The Potato Eaters. Eaters. But today, still three and a half days a week, the Dutch eat potatoes on the chairs at the same table at more or less the same time of the day complaining about the weather. And they will do for some years. If you look at other examples, we see that the bicycle in the Netherlands is still already for 100 years the most important transportation tool. We see that houses that were built in the 30s are still very popular today and actually rebuilt. And it's very expensive to rebuild them. IKEA was founded in 1951 using the same concept today, and the world-famous key, and you see it here, is still used. So 60, 70 years of innovation was already done there, and we still use it. So actually, it's not that bad. And one example that I had to mention here is, in Austria, you really want to have a law that prevents that cash is going to disappear, because you want to have no digital 100% alternatives. Cash needs to be there. So when we look at the future, I think the stability we have with these tools and these examples, it is really nice to have. But we also need to go forward. We need to have people that are doing groundbreaking research and want to go the extra step, want to do that extra mile. But there we have another issue to solve. Because in all these things, we see, I see, a lot of people really think that they are different and that they are unique. And therefore, they need a special approach or a specific solution. And I want, to example, I want to use an example to highlight that a little bit better. As mentioned in the introduction, I'm in the biobanking arena, but before this I had a commercial role. And I was in a situation where I was at a biobank, where people on the other side of the table were explaining me how unique and how special their biobank was. And they really needed something else that wasn't produced before. This is a scala of tubes that you see here, and in a biobank you store plasma or serum, you make aliquots, and you store it in a freezer for future research. And at that time we could offer 2 ml, 3 ml, 4 ml, 6 ml, and 8 ml tubes. But the customer said, no, no, I'm really special. I need a 3.5 ml. Can you make it for me? And besides the pre-barcoded system, I want to have the option to write something on that little tube because I don't really trust IT. Of course, I'm in sales, so I make the deal, but it doesn't make sense. We are making something special because that biobank thinks that they are really, really unique. But it doesn't help the patient. It doesn't help research. It's just a company that makes something with a lead time of six to nine months, helping somebody that thinks that is unique. But really, I have my doubts. And I would like to quote the Dutch philosopher René ten Bos, who always said, Martin Luther King, Einstein, and Mandela. They were unique. The others, I have my doubts. Oh, I go too fast once. 
Let me give you another example where actually the drive to be unique stops real innovation. At the moment, we have the option to share digital health records. If you look at Estonia, they really do it. Everything is digitalized. I live in the Netherlands, in Nijmegen, that's southeast of the country. If I would go to Amsterdam, 100 kilometers east, something would happen to me, nobody knows anything. No access. So you need to do the basic work first, you need to do the administration first, and then you can start with the treatment and really help me. But that's weird. But because the Dutch are so different from Estonia, we don't go there and learn from them because we are special. We want something different. But it stops real, real, real progress. It doesn't make sense. So again there, are we going to reinvent the wheel or are we going to say, well, let's be like the Estonians. Let's have a better approach, not to waste too much money and actually make progress because that is really helping us. And then you really also talk about horizontal innovation. What is happening in other disciplines that we can use today? And we don't have to wait 10 years. In pharma, a new treatment can take 10 years, but that's not helping the patient today. So therefore, I would like to give you an example where we have been very successful by looking at other disciplines, other industries, and other worlds where they already solved for a long time a problem that actually you could copy-paste into another world. In the 70s, Automation and robotization in the food industry became common. And there you really wanted to have standardization and efficiency to have higher food quality of food production. A lot of companies started to learn on that, and there also we had a lot of experience around industrial automation. Now, 20 years later, in my first job, a veterinary lab comes to me and says, hey, we are doing 5,000 blood analysis a day. We want to automatize that. Can you help us? And we really think you should replace a lab technician with two robotic arms. And we said, with our food hat on, actually it doesn't make sense. You really need something very simple that can do the thing that is not going to break down every day and you need a specific mechanic to make it happen. Standardize. Standardize what is already there. The veterinary lab kept saying how special they were, and that they were unique and they really needed something over engineers. At the end of the day, we could convince them there are solutions out there already Drop the ego stuff, use it. That system is still running today without any problem. But it took us a lot of time to actually convince those people to say, hey, be brave enough to look at the food industry and look at the things that are already there today that can help you drive your progress. That means that if you look at other sites or if you look at other disciplines, you can still learn from each other. And actually, you would expect in the scientific world that that would be very common. And actually, it's not especially in academia, it's really, really difficult to share what you are doing or to share what you want to achieve. And there are several reasons for it, and they absolutely make common sense. Because in a lot of cases, as a researcher, as a student, you need to secure funding, which also means you need to publish. And pharma needs to understand that you can't share without any boundaries your work before you have published. Also, their lawyers need to understand. But it also means that some things are stopping because the publications are so key that actually it might stop you from going one step further. The second thing is, what we see is that the publications out there, you have to give for free, they are making billions out of it. So I have to pay to read somebody else's article and to learn from what he's actually doing. I think it's a world that we can't change today, but we should, because it's a weird system. And we really should acknowledge all the researchers that are doing the hard work and we should acknowledge industry, but we need to find a modus to actually get better in this, because it's really stopping, I think, real having impact and really having an innovational uh, approach. But then there is an example where it actually happened, and this is actually one of the, the toughest part of my speech that I had to remember. In 1883, Emil Christian Hansen developed a tool to actually produce consistent beer. By isolating yeast, he was able to have consistent quality of beer. And that really had an impact, and that changed the beer process all around the world. At that time, that process was works of fortune. But the founder of Carlsberg, owner of the lab where it was discovered, said, no, I'm going to share this with all breweries in the world. And I'm not going to patent it, and I'm not going to ask anything for it. Maybe at that time, he knew that he was not going to be beaten, or he thought, from now on, in every beer on the, on the world, there will be some Carlsberg in it. 
But at that time, 1883, basically he was doing open science. And that's something that I think we could do more today. It's not going to be easy. This is the quote that he had in his office and is still in Carlsberg today. But I think it could motivate us to have a different look on things, on how to share and how to make things possible uh, in a better way. Open science is not always easy. There are a lot of boundaries that you have to stick to. You have to publish the way that it is. Uh, but maybe it can help. Um, then I want to go back to the last example. Um, oh, this is one too quickly, where we see another good example of people learning from each other and actually really making an impact in the medical world. If you look at high-stress jobs, one of the things is being a surgeon. Um, and even though you are the best in class and you have the best team, when it's hectic, when it's stressful, and you are tired, you can make mistakes. But in the past, I don't know how it is today, we also know it is absolutely not done as a staff member to say to the top surgeon that he's making a mistake. You simply don't do that or it's ending your career. There are some hospitals says, we need to improve this process. We need to look at other worlds. And they went to the pilots. Pilots do a high-risk job, and it can be high stressful. How are they doing it? And they did a lot of research on stress management, error management. What can we do? Now we see aviation industry and hospitals are talking to each other and learning from each other. That's real progress. That's real progress today for some people that just looked a bit broader and really want to have an impact. Not in 2030, not in 2050, but already today. So my call of action to you today is remember that you are unique, keep doing on what you're doing, but don't be shy with the results that you have. Share it with others, go to other industries, learn from them, read another book about it or go to another conference. Because sometimes we are just inside a very little bubble, we all know each other and we know what we're doing, that's not really making progress. Reach out to anybody else, and then sometimes you can have a day that is not Instagrammable, or a bit slow, or a bit boring, but we need that to really have breakthrough innovation. So I wish you all nice careers with every day and then, very boring weeks, but keep fundamentally going, and I think it's gonna be a huge impact for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>